Hello, and welcome to the Six Months to Six Figure series of the Double Your Freelancing podcast. I'm your host, Zach Swinehart. I'm here with Maya. And in this series, we follow a specific freelancer, so in this case, Maya, as I coach them from early stages to earning a six-figure annual income. Six figures, $100,000, broken down, comes out to about $8,333 a month. So my challenge with this series is to see how quickly I can get somebody earning $8,333 a month, uh, with the goal being get there within six months. Uh, in this series, I connect with Maya every week or two, and it follows the same basic format of the coaching sessions in the DYF Accelerator community. So if you're over there watching this and you're like, ooh, it'd be so cool to get coached like this by Zach, uh, you can totally get coached by me like this if you join the Accelerator community. You can learn more about that at dyf.link forward slash dyfa. So let's start the interview. Maya, hello. We were chatting um, kind of before this interview, and there's a little bit of a delay. So you, the user, listener, person, sorry about the delay. We'll maybe switch to Zoom if the delay doesn't work. This is the cost of Maya being an awesome digital nomad is that today we're working with crappy Italian Wi-Fi. Okay, so we promised you Wi-Fi issues. We had Wi-Fi issues, so now we're in Zoom. It's working better, but that's why we look and sound a little bit different. So Maya, you were just saying the ideal takeaways from this session were staying on top of these concurrent projects to not let things fall through the cracks mm -hmm. and getting prepped for like delegating admin tasks. Uh, and you also mentioned to mm -hmm. me before, like wanting to make your focus the agency and raising rates. So presumably that's yeah. a big part of the the picture too. So, mm -hmm. so yeah, so I guess with all this said, um, tell me what's up or ask me a question or, or basically like, tell me where you're struggling. Um, tell me what the pains are, whatever we can kind of go from there. Mm -hmm. So I, at the moment, I only have three design projects, which is fine, which is my branding projects that they take four weeks. I know how to juggle that. But right now, I don't know how it happened that now I'm doing a bunch of one-on-ones. And what it used to be the content playbook service, service is now more like mentoring one-on-one, -on -one, like creative mentoring. And I have six one-on-ones. Clients, which is the part that is a lot of back and forth, and I'm really high touch, really like checking in with them on Telegram. And I want to give them a high touch experience, but I also don't want to keep the tabs open like, oh, I should send it yeah. to this person, I should make this for this person. Um, because I love sending resources, you know, it's really like I, I really love that, but I also have to prioritize my other clients and I have to prioritize working on blank page. Yeah, and as I understand it, these previous packaged up and now just kind of ad hoc one on ones, like they're your lowest paying yeah. gigs as well, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. So um so with these, you said like you kind of fell into this. Like I know you've been doing your time tracking and stuff. Do you have have you done an audit of your past couple of weeks to see like where your hours are going in terms mm -hmm. of design projects or these coaching ones or administrative or what? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, I took four hours uh, last week on just creating the Gantt chart, creating all the tasks, checking and checking again. I didn't even count like Telegram hours that I was just like going through conversations to see if I marked everything back on Notion. But maybe it was an admin day that I just dumped everything, but it has been like the most administrative tasks that I've done in Blank Page. And I was like, holy shit. <laughs> like that was, that was a lot that was really um for my studio that is like really low maintenance you know i have my three clients i talk to them like when i start the project and when i hand off the project like now it's starting to feel like there's a lot of communication to do and it's starting to feel like that it cannot be done without me you know like mm. before i didn't feel it so much and now i'm delegating a lot of things to my designer and she's amazing um but now the coaching part is really feeling like the studio will not run without me, which is a feeling mm. that is a bit icky. That makes sense. So that totally makes sense. And in my mind, this might be so it could it could illustrate a couple things. It could either show number one that you know you just need processes. This is new, and that's maybe just how it goes. Um, or number two, it could show that this kind of work is kind of inherently going to need you more and that the price probably needs to reflect that. And I think both mm -hmm. are true. Like I think about this in DYF. I think one of the, as I think about scaling W freelancing and scaling the community and all the time that I have to like work in the business to run yeah. the accelerator community, 
the, the obvious eventual step is that I would need to, if I'm going to try to scale this business, I would need to replace myself as the head coach. But that's like really difficult. You know, that's probably one of the last roles you can replace. But what, what I could do is replace the things that kind of go into being the coach and build automations, processes, and like staff support so that all I have to do is show up and be the face versus all the processing, all the planning, all the task management. And it sounds like that's what you're drowning in right now is all the yeah. stuff that goes into it. So yeah. So yeah, I mean, I guess the thing I'm trying to figure out is like, what's the thing to debug? Do we talk about the processes and the fulfillment of these coaching projects? Or do we talk about if you should even be doing these coaching projects at all? Yeah, I think I think I want to find a way that they're really high touch but high price. Like I want to be charging because I enjoy it so much, but I want to be charging double of what I'm charging right now, which for two, like I'm still keeping it the same price. Um, I'm keeping two weeks of support with me. Like you get your meeting, you get two weeks of support. That's four, four, four dollars and meeting notes, high touch support. But I really want to do like a whole month for like 1200. That's what I would like to do. And I don't want to keep doing two weeks. Like I want to do one off more. That is like you meet with me and then you get the two weeks, one week of support via Telegram. And like after that meeting. But I would I would prefer so much more to get three really good clients that are paying thousand each. And those are my retainer clients, not doing six for half the price. Because then I can't give them the attention that they want, you know, that they need. Yeah. Or I honestly, it's not that I can't give me the attention that I want because I will give them the attention, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And I, something maybe worth thinking about, and it's why I structured the accelerator the way that I did, is uh, mm -hmm. where the open loops come from. Because I, I was saying it before, I hate open loops. I hate concurrent projects. I, I don't, it's probably something about my ADHD brain. I don't know. But for me, like, the more things I have to remember, the more anxious I get because I forget everything. So I have to create systems to like help me not forget things. But the more yeah. things there are to remember, the more complex those systems have to be, and the more like an administrative time takes to even review yeah. those systems. You know, uh, something that helps me is asking like, what things can I put in place to close the loop as soon as it's open? So like a good example of this is that when I work with clients. I like to work with them live when possible so that it's there. it kind of eliminates me sending them an email saying, hey, I need blah, blah, blah. And now I have to wait for them yeah. to get me it. And then I can continue working. By working live, they can just get me it live. And I say you have to be on Slack. So the reason I say this is that the parallel here might be that the Telegram support is okay. contributing to open loops. Because Telegram support, it's like nebulous. It has a kind of a fluffy scope. It doesn't happen at a fixed time. It's just like whenever they happen to message you, you need to react to it. Mm -hmm. And so so part of me wonders if you were to kind of model after how I've positioned the value of the accelerator, which is like we have set office hours events where you can come mm -hmm. up and ask questions. Uh, and with your cheaper package, you could do something kind of like the accelerator office hours or something like group coaching, where it's like every week for the lower priced ones, they can come to the group coaching sessions and they can ask their questions there and they can pre-submit questions to like get priority answers so that you you kind of answer the questions in the order they were asked. So that's like one way you could do this. And then you could have your high ticket coaching that maybe includes the telegram support and includes weekly one-on-ones for an hour or something like that might be the way. Because the reason I say all this is that I do think you're undercharging and the value de you deliver is huge, but mm -hmm. the person you currently deliver the value to is in my mind probably quite often a pretty fundamentally price sensitive person because the person you like to serve yeah. here is the one who needs their initial inertia like they need the matchstick to like get going and people yes. who are just trying to get going are always the most price sensitive and it's like that thing brennan says in the blueprint of multiply not create if you are enhancing something that already exists it's an easier sell because that person's already doing revenue and they already have money. But if you're trying to help somebody get started in the first place, they don't, they're not started yet. So they don't have the money coming from this thing. And anything they invest into it is like coming out of their personal savings. Yeah. Um so that I guess that the door that, that opens is like, are any of the people you're doing the coaching for right now 
people like your most successful clients who you've done base camp for? Like, are you doing coaching as a follow-up retainer for any base camp people right now? Or is it all for the newbies? Just one, just one, no two actually, but it's an old client. So one, um, it's the sex educator coach, which is like my retainer for seven months. Everything is fine with her. It's a very good balance. Like I feel like she's paying what she's getting for and I feel like I am getting paid well. And, but I have a new a client that I worked with on Basecamp when Basecamp was like a thousand, you know, like two years ago. And she's like, oh, I would love to work with you again. And she, we're doing a retainer um, for 450 a month. And it includes two calls and like notion support and a lot of art direct, like art, like curating her feed, but just like adding photos and stuff. It's slow-ish friction, but I do feel like I'm undercharging, but I don't want to charge her more because I love her. It's a problem that I really like I have I'm attached to my to my coaching clients and I see like I see their problems. I see how they want to raise their prices. You know, most of them are service providers. So I'm like, mm, listen, I'm also raising mine. You know, it's like a really awkward conversation. So I like what you're saying of separating, having like options of like we can still do the retainer, but you are you know, the, the low tier of the retainer where we do you know office hours and we do email correspondence and then you can join the other tier which is telegram support and twice a week like one hour meetings yeah and i think you could also like if you if you think about who's going to benefit from each you could think about what done for you stuff to layer on like if if the person who you want joining your retainer is somebody who's already done base camp they're going to benefit the most from done for you services so Whenever you do coaching for somebody, you essentially give them homework assignments. Like we leave these calls. I'm like, Maya, go spend five hours on Instagram marketing. That's like the, mm -hmm. the coaching approach. Whereas the done for you would be like, Maya, how about you just give me some money and I'll do all your Instagram posts for you. And when you're, when you're a freelancer, like that's why clients are hiring you is the done for you versus the coaching. And so if somebody's already hired you for Basecamp, like they've already shown that they're willing to invest in the done for you stuff. Uh, so maybe the way that you can raise your rates for past clients and maybe the way that you could charge even more than 1200 is that your premium tier thing, it includes coaching, but it also includes done for you so that there's uh -huh. like some blend where you might be doing social media management or some design stuff or something to take work off their plate yeah. instead of only putting work on their plate. I don't know what your thoughts are on that. If that's something no, you find that's value in. I really like that because I like my highest paying client, which is the client that wanted to do my the bundle of my two services together. She like I sent her the prototype of the membership and she was like, yes, I want to do the three month bundle, you know, and I'm like, OK, amazing. But then apart from that, I'll send her my add ons and say, yes, let's do one month of coaching. But let's do your, you know, content planning calendar. Let's do your newsletter strategy. Um, how would you would you do it in a menu like not a menu like a service deck or would you like how would you how would you um pitch that upsell or downsell i would i would pitch it based on deliverables in a productized way based on where they like where they find the most value so with my little agency experiment that i'm going to run the hypothesis for this agency i'll start around it's essentially like a content agency is that these course creator folks highly mm -hmm. prioritize releasing regular newsletters and that that's like a top priority for them. And so mm -hmm. the core hook of this like ongoing package is going to be that you get to put out blog posts, you get to put out newsletters, YouTube videos, but it takes like barely any of your time. So you can now use this time to grow your business instead of creating these newsletters because this is something I personally yeah. struggle with. Uh, so similarly, like with your clients who've hired you for your base cap, who like your sex educator client, for example, if, if I, Zach is, if I'm who we're talking about, one of my highest value, like ongoing things to do is the newsletter. But I get the sense for your clients, maybe they see their high value thing of like content creation as Instagram. I don't know. What do you think? hundred yeah, percent is always Instagram. So for my how much, age. okay. How much time do you reckon your average client is spending per week on Instagram right now? Creating content, I'd say like four hours, five four hours, hours organizing photos, more and more, eight hours organizing photos, writing captions, just 
if you if you buffering like imposter syndrome and should I pose this today and like it's very difficult for people to pose without having a coach on like yeah really and, that's what's something I've noticed and so if you so including the coaching component but also like taking it a step further if you imagine that you did everything in your power everything humanly possible for you, including things you needed to enlist subcontract help for where you personally are weak. If you did everything in your power to just own Instagram for them, of those eight hours, how many of them do you think you could like take off their plate? Like how much, how much would they still have to spend? Would it be zero? Would it be one? Would it be two? Would it be three? That kind of thing. I'd say like three hours because I do sit down and write everything with them. Like I, that's the only thing that I really do live that I found really cool that you said that is sitting down and writing like captions for a month, content for a month with them, you know, and helping them come up with ideas. So I'd say like, they would still have to work for three hours, but every week. it's every week on an, on Instagram instead of eight. If I were to give them a content calendar with 30 posts already made, you know, everything designed, like they just have to go on Notion, download and post. Um, yeah, they would still have to spend like three hours, maybe inbound, outbound, engagement, um, posting, reposting, sharing stories. So you don't think that you could handle the posting for them, like with Meet Edgar or one of those tools? No, I don't want to like, I don't want to have to ever do community management because then I'm getting into a very ad hoc territory. Like I need it yesterday territory, you know, mm. or can I do with this quick change? Cause it's urgent. Cause it comes out tomorrow territory. Okay. Let me write that down. Mm -hmm. But I mean, from eight to three hours, like I would pay that service. You know, if someone's going to tell me and someone that has good taste tells me, I'm going to curate your feed. You don't have to do anything. You just have to like approve, write captions and post it automatically. Everything for blank page, for example, um, I'll be like, fuck yeah, you know, I'd, I'd pay yeah. for, yeah, for a ca for an arsenal, for content bank, you know, for me to create like a timeless content bank for someone, which is a service that I've been like thinking about, but I don't know how to like frame it. Yeah. I mean, so for me, the way I'm going to position it that I think is the, the best way to frame it, especially speaking to what you're talking about with imposter syndrome and stuff is I've found with my most successful clients, they're very busy. And usually if I give someone who's really busy a homework assignment, they like won't do it because they have to, they, they see it as like, oh, I've got to carve out time on my calendar. I don't know how long it's going to take. I, it's hard. I got to get in the headspace, the imposter syndrome, all these things. And the big hack I found was just, I'm like, okay, block out this time and we'll do it live. And everyone can block out two or three hours because it's a finite thing. It's like, okay, I just got to show up and Zach's going to hold my hand through this whole thing and I'm going to leave with whatever result. Uh, so to me, that's kind of, that's the value delivery is like, you pay me this money, you get this thing, which is a fully fleshed out Instagram content calendar. And it gets you, like it, it buys back 20 hours a month of your time. So the question I'm at, I would ask you, Maya, is mm -hmm. for people who are like, let's say your sex educator client, what do you reckon like if they, if you could indeed create 20 hours a month for them, do you know what kind of income they believe they could create with that time? If like, so remember how I said, Maya, I want you to spend five hours a week doing lead gen on Instagram. Mm -hmm. And that, that the consequence of that was that you were able to essentially raise your monthly income by what? Like, I feel like a few thousand dollars a month or something. I don't remember even now, but you got a lot more leads as a, as a result of that. So in the case of me putting the Instagram marketing on your plate, that essentially resulted in like $3,000 a month extra. And in this case, I didn't buy back any of your time. I just told you to go do it. Uh, so what do you think your sex educator client would believe they could drive an in income if they had 20 extra hours a month? Mm, it's a difficult question. Like I do feel like if I did all the social media for a whole month for her, she would have time to work on her business. Because I do see her all the time, very like focusing the minutia of mm -hmm. Instagram, which is of course fun and rewarding and validating. But I know that there's so much stuff she should be doing, like focusing on collaborations in life event, real life events. So 
it's a, it's a really good idea to meet with someone three hours a month and say, we are going to get this shit done. I will design it. We will write every caption. We will write what you're going to post every day. We will also write the stories. I'll give you a Notion template that has every single thing for you to download. That would be a really good asset for a lot of people. I would say that I know you don't want to do community management, so <laughs> that's cool. But if you could take it to the next level where you could do something like, for example, they're allowed to post whatever they want as long as it doesn't mess with your your content strategy or something. But you are going to straight up schedule all this for them so that they don't even have to think about it. They could just like fuck off and not even touch their Insta stuff they wanted to and it would still be getting regular updates. Like to me, that's the that's the the really sexy sell because then you know it's just sorted. Whereas saying like, okay, Zach, we're going to spend this time and then I'm going to link you to a Notion document that you have to go do stuff with on your own. Like it just sounds a little bit, a little bit less sexy is all. But I totally respect your standpoint. And if you don't think you could have rules that would be followed to avoid the urgency and fires, like, for example, you just say like, we're going to build this content calendar. I understand that sometimes things change, but just be aware that with the way we work, if something needs to change urgently, you'll be expected to do that yourself. Any lead time, like anything you want us changing, we need at least a three day lead time for or a five day lead time for or we need to batch it or whatever your rules are to make you not hate your life. Uh, and you can totally put those rules in place if the yeah. clients would agree to them. But um, but yeah, so so the core question is, you believe the sex educators should be focusing on collabs and live events and things that would move the needle. Do they believe that? Do they know that? That's my question. What do you, what's your hunch say? Yeah, we work on it a lot. We work on it a lot and it's hard for her to carve out time from her normal schedule, from her like actual like pelvic doctor um, a job. To then sit down and it's like oh shit i have to post on instagram and then it's like oh but you know i feel like it's it the it, the thing about instagram is that it's like the obvious thing that when you do it it's like oh i did it i'm working on my business but i know i know because i spent a long time without it i know that it's really not what moves the needles it's what brings clients in but there's a lot of things that have to be done um outside yeah. of social media marketing a lot of things and a lot of personal things uh, have to be done outside of it. The cool, the cool hook with the way that you like to work with your clients that could really beef out the value here is that, like this is something I think about with my own hypothetical service offering, is that if I buy this person back 20 or 30 hours a month, but then they spend those 20 or 30 hours a month poorly, they're not going to like get an ROI, you know, they're not going to think it's worth it to have bought back that time if they just spent the time like, I don't know, answering emails or going on social media or something. And so to me, like a really important part probably of working with a client is going to be that there has to be some coaching and accountability components to say, okay, I didn't buy you these 30 hours back. So you can do stupid stuff like go hang out with your kids, you idiot. <laughs> I wouldn't say that. That's a joke, by the way. Um, but like, you know, it would be a coaching component to kind of like help them make sure that they replace it with what's important. And maybe for them, it is the kids thing. And if for them, they're like, ooh, this is super worth it because now I get to hang out with my kids, whereas before I didn't, then fine, that's great. Uh, but if they're using it for, say, like checking emails or something that's not going to actually provide an ROI, then maybe my monthly service is what gets the red pen when they're looking for things to cut. Mm -hmm. Whereas if they attach my monthly service to something that's generating way more money than they're spending, it's never going to get cut as an expense, as long as it keeps mm -hmm. being valuable. So similarly, maybe you can add a coaching component here where it's like, not only am I going to totally sort out your content calendar for you, I'm going to be like a collaborative um, accountability partner for you to make sure that the time that I'm freeing up, which will probably be like 20 hours a month, is going to go to stuff that's going to generate tons of revenue for your business and really move the needle. And then you hold them accountable to like track their time and all the things I force you to do, uh, you force them to track how much time they're spending approaching collabs, putting on live events, things like that. And obviously this benefits them and it benefits you too, because the more ROI you can get them with this bot back time, the more they see the like non-negotiable value of your service. Mm -hmm. Wow, that's really like landing page like material, seriously. Super, because I feel like that really resonates with my um, with my audience. Like, not only will we save you 20 hours, but also we will teach you how to use those 20 hours to work on the things that actually matter and see the things that matter. You know, so I feel yeah. like 
I feel like, uh, and I don't wanna, how do you say in English? I hear people saying like, toot, toot my own hoot or something like that. Toot your own like horn. <laughs> but, <laughs> I like toot my own hoot though, that's good. I don't, wanna, I don't wanna toot my own horn, but like I'm really fucking good at saying this is not important. Like I wanna work only 20 hours this week, fuck everything else, you know? Mm -hmm. And when I hear people just dreaming about, oh, I wanna do this, I wanna do that, and they spend like 10 hours on it, and then it doesn't go anywhere. Like it makes me cringe. So something that I really want to help people do is to really like build MVPs, you know, build ugly and then see if it works. And also focus on the things that are going to drive you, that are going to drive you, period, you know? And yeah. this component is really important. Uh, what to do when you are paying a designer to save you time, but then you're wasting it on like Instagram. Yeah. And it it is good for top of funnel content as well. Like um, you could, if you're building authority, building brand content for blank page, you can say like the big mistake people make when they hire us for planning their social media calendar. And the mistake can be they don't use their bought back time effectively or something like that, which has a subtle nod mm -hmm. to the value of how your service buys back time. Of oh, coaching, yeah. I think overall, by the way, we have six minutes left. Um, just keeping an eye <laughs> on the yeah. timer. But I think overall, one of the most important lessons is that I have to really sit down and consolidate my offer ecosystem. And I can't keep pitching, oh, yeah, let's work one on one. Yeah, I can do that for you. Oh, for sure. Here's my Telegram number. Like, I have to consolidate it and I have to think about either separating it in lower tier, upper tier, or really starting a group coaching situation because. I I feel like it's coming. I, I, I feel ready for it soon. Yeah, I mean, I think I think doing ad hoc one-off stuff across the board, it it's not bad. In fact, I think it is a really important part of the process. I think I think that, you know, you and I talk about scaffolding and stuff. Like mm -hmm. I think trying to think of a service offering in a vacuum without testing things out and without having clients book you for random one-offs, like it's just liable to be wrong. So what I would rather see is exactly what you're doing, which is making gradual pivots, seeing what's working, what needs work, that kind of thing. So to me, the, the, I think a good next step to kind of to try to tie all of this together, like, so instead of building a landing page for this hypothetical service offering we're talking about, what I think the easiest way to do, or like the easiest way to validate this, pull up the mm -hmm. blueprint, the bit about like the Trojan horse interview and whatnot. And I think the easiest way to do this is to literally in Notion or whatever, wherever you want to take notes, like even in your paper journal, lay out, just like I've been describing to you, how I have this hypothetical service offering, lay one out for yourself. Say like, if I were to do what I think would be the dopest, illest, most awesome package, what would it be? What would it include? And then what's the result of that for their business? Like what? So if it's saying I'm managing their social media for them, don't stop there. Say, why does this matter? Why why should they care? What's the impact on their business and their life? What's it going to allow them to do? All the stuff we've been talking about here. And then uh, break it down and say, how much time, if I'm going to do this for a month, let's say, how much time will it take me personally? Mm -hmm. And then how much time might it take different team members? So you can guess that for now and for the very foreseeable future, you're going to need to be the one on those live phone calls with them doing strategy. So I mm -hmm. would I would say map out map out exactly how much time you think that would take for a whole month of the you sitting on the phone with them time. Think about how much um, writing time it would take, which it might be zero because you're gonna do it live on the phone. And so if that's the case, it'd be zero. Think about how much design time it would take, which would be your designer doing it. So basically do all these things to find out your your fixed costs. And then what you can do is you know what you pay a designer add a buffer, like maybe double it. So if you think it's going to take three hours at 20 bucks an hour, assume it's going to take six hours at 20 or, you know, three hours at 40. And if you know it's going to take you, so if it's if it's four calls at three hours each, that means your personal output is going to be 12 hours, plus you're the project manager and stuff. So... Yes. Hmm? The, the project manager stuff is like, ugh. <laughs> yeah. Yes. But... um you can outsource that stuff. But mm -hmm. it would be smart to track how much time you're spending on it so that you know how to budget for that. Uh, what I had the the interview last week with Prana and Mayak Malik, and what they do is when they're budgeting their projects, 
they set their targeted effective hourly rate for a thousand dollars an hour for anything that requires Prerna writing. So if there's a project that's going to require 10 hours of Prerna's hands on a keyboard, that is like ten thousand dollars at the bottom line. And then if they know that they need to pay their researcher a thousand bucks to do their research, they take that thousand and add about twenty percent to it. They have a very slim margin on the markup for their subcontractors because they have that thousand dollars an hour for themselves as the buffer. Uh, so you could do something similar to this. And then you could add enough margin that it feels really comfortable for you. Like, you know, you're going to make money and you know, you're going to hit your effective hourly rate. I would say for you, try to target like at least 150 an hour because you're super undercharging right now and you're often not hitting that. Okay. Um, yes. And then look at what the total price would be and then ask yourself, will they think this is a no brainer? So let's say you add it all up and when you consider the 12 hours you have to spend as the interviewer and then a few hours as the project manager and then probably five or 10 design hours or whatever it is going to be, you add all this up and you're like, okay, so this is going to need to cost about $2,000 a month. And it's going to buy back like the, the value delivery of the 2000, the quote, packaged up, productized, bow on top, gift wrapped, what you get is, mm -hmm. by the way, don't worry about the fact we only have one minute left. I can go a little bit over, no worries. The what you get is uh, 20 hours a month bought back. A super sexy, super clean content calendar built out. Coaching to ensure that you're spending your time growing your business. More money because you did the shit that actually moves the needle and puts money in your pockets. Like make the really sexy what you get and then ask for the amount of money that my sex educator client makes. Like, I don't know if you know how much she makes or you can make guesses, but for her income, is this price a no brainer? Because the thing that strikes me with my hypothetical content offering is that if I'm working with, say, a course creator who's making like, I don't know, 80 grand a year, right? If they make about 80 grand a year and they have a VA and it's just them, and I'm going to be charging over $2,000 a month, like let's say it's $3,000 a month, is someone really going to want to pay over 50% of what they're even bringing in the door just to take care of their newsletter? I don't know. I don't think that's no-brainer pricing. If someone's making 500K a year and they can pay like 30 grand to take care of this thing, then probably. So some of it's going to depend on the client. Do you have a, a guess of like what this person is making per month? Yeah. Okay. Do you... um? Do you know what you think the no-brainer price would be for her? Well, we do we do eight 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 retainers, and she did say that they were getting a bit expensive month after month. But I, you know, we had a conversation that it's like, girl, I love you, but I can't, you know, I can't lower my prices. So I know that eight 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 is almost a no-brainer, but it's a bit more than a no-brainer. It's a yeah. it's a brainer. So I yeah, I think. That's her sweet spot, for example, okay. you know, and this is like a person that works as a doctor and earns like a well salary, I guess is that she doesn't know the value of yeah. what I'm giving her also, because it's a passion project, you know, it's not and that's what like I was gonna say. Has... Yeah. Mm -hmm. Sometimes like I had this one client years ago when I was a newbie and I was undercharging where like he was like nickel and diming me and I think paid like three or four hundred dollars for his website. And he like acted like he had no money to spend on the thing. But then he like. He, he was like a race car driver as a hobbyist and he would spend like $20,000 a month on his fucking race car because race cars are very expensive. Um, so it's just one of those things where like sometimes people have different value systems and uh -huh. it could be that paying 888 for just coaching feels expensive, but paying $2,000 or $3,000 or whatever to like take a bunch of stuff off the plate um, doesn't. So I think that that's something to keep in mind is that sometimes it's not just 888 as a number and that usually it's more like 888 in exchange for XYZ thing. Yeah. But but yeah, so this could be cool to play with. So that's like kind of one facet. But the other stuff I wanted to to talk about. So, oh yeah. So I guess let, let me wrap that up. So first step, lay out what you think a really cool service offering would be. That would like be super high value for the client and then do the trojan horse interview style thing where you say like hey i'd love to get your take on this can we jump on the phone and i just run it by you and you like basically run the service offering by her and, and you say you don't you don't position that as if it's for her necessarily you could just say like this is something i'm thinking about doing as an offering for people like you i'd love to get your take or something or for okay. my other or for my clients i'd love to get that your sounds take. great and yeah i can do it with two clients that i would love to get their input on it it sounds really and, good um, and the in that course, there's like the the lesson is called um, 
following up or it's called like validating your positioning. If you go reference that, uh, okay. you can put together your list and you can ask like, what are the things that, what are the big pains? Like try to find out the pains in their business, the things they wish they could get rid of and take off their plate, what they do with time that was freed up, stuff like that. So that would be one thing. And then the other thing I was thinking is that since you have all these projects on your plate for the coaching, it could be interesting to see what exactly each one of these coaching clients is taking up in terms of your time. And you could probably tell me right now, actually, do you know, including Telegram, including the live sessions, all the little open loops, everything, do you know what your total time dedicated to these yeah. six coaching clients was last week? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, well, I, ha I have it in my in my time tracker. I have it in separate clients. Okay, but great. yeah, I do. I do. I can like pull that out and understand that after this and do like a mini audit. That's okay. overdue. Yeah, I think it would be smart just because it would be interesting to see what your effective hourly rate is right now. Mm -hmm. Because it, I kind of get the sense it's not gonna be very high for these ones. I get the sense that with all the administrative stuff and open loops, and not not to even mention the mental mental energy drain of just trying to like keep track of these different things. Um, I wouldn't be surprised to hear that as it is now, it needs work in order to be a good investment for you. Totally. And just because I work fast doesn't mean that I'm not undercharging. Yeah. Because I'm also charging for my energy. So that's like, exactly. that's my mantra. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And um, we think there was something else I wanted to mention. Um. Yeah, I feel like we went really in the weeds. Oh, I guess your other thing you want to take away is the delegating of admin tasks. So I think the easiest thing to be looking at right now mm -hmm. to sort sort of start prepping is say like, what are the recurring tasks? What are the things I need to keep doing? What are the things that go into doing XYZ things? So if, for example, you have a base camp project, maybe one step is that you have to curate this mood board. And then another step is you have to do blah, blah, blah prep thing. And then the next step is you have to do the actual designing. So think about like, any tasks that you keep doing for every single project, whether it's a base camp project or one of these coaching ones or this new hypothetical service offering, just kind of keep a pulse for what are the what are the things I keep doing that are outside of my zone of genius that I could create an SOP for because they're kind of done similarly each time. And then later, those will be the things to like create the SOPs for and to delegate. But for right now, if you're in this experimental phase where you're still kind of even figuring out what goes into doing something, it's kind of premature to delegate because I think the the first step for really effective delegation is consistency. So yeah, yeah, yeah. once you have a solidified service offering and once you have a solidified way of fulfilling it, that's like the basis for delegation. And that the first goal has to be getting to that point, I think. Yeah. No, totally. And I'm I'm okay with this. Like honestly, I've been thinking about it and I just started. Like I started in January actually because I came back from India. I came back online to Instagram. I had my first clients again, you know, like I've been a designer. I was working for like L'Oreal brands forever, but my agency blank page just started 8 months after. You know, I have I'm I'm overbooked. Like I I have trust in this consistency. Like I know that I'm going to get there. I really feel it. Yeah. Honestly, before we go, I would be interested in looking at your time report if you're down to just look at it right now. Yeah, you're going to laugh at it so much because it's this app called Focus To Do. Okay. <laughs> you're going to laugh so much. Yeah, I will send that to you. <laughs> okay. So it's not in Toggle. It's in Focus To Do. Yeah, it's like this Chinese. Um, I, I, yeah, I, I love a good like designed app. I really care about that. So it has colors and it's really beautiful. And it has a Pomodoro timer, so I'll send you. Because I also like did a little bit of housekeeping after watching the video, um, the training on time tracking. Uh, but yeah, I'd love to send it to you actually, so you see how much time I spent on like things. Yeah, let's look now. Okay. Do too. Yeah. Okay. Let's do it. Um, wait. Focus. I said you want me to uh, share my screen. Sure. Let's do it. Focus to do, and maybe you'll like it. All right, select the tab, entire screen. Hope there's nothing unsavory around here. Let's see. Just mood boards. All right, so um, these are my, can you see it? Yeah. Okay, 
So these are my categories. Let me mm -hmm. toggle it down to nothing. So you see it? Look, here you are, courses, mm -hmm. coaching, content. OK, so these are my categories that I did a little bit of, um, about what you said. When I go here, I can see, for example, the weekly. So I spent mm -hmm. four hours and 45 in Dona Garzon, which is my new retainer client. I was doing Instagram templates for her. So okay. it took me like, yeah, five and a half hours if I calculate like back and forth on Telegram. That's already paid for. That was in July. And, and can, we, I start, can you go uh -huh. back to your last week, by the way? Because this is only going to be today and yesterday, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, for sure. let's peek at last week because I'm just curious of like what's finished. Mm-hmm. So four hours was for a, a newsletter that I was setting up for this client. Okay. Um, then 36 minutes for, for Donna Garzon, this client. And this week, so I guess I'll tell you like this. I spend six hours on this client, let's say seven with the meeting, and I charge her 888. No, that's not true. For, for her, 720 for her templates and for a content strategy session 720 was for six hours so i'm nowhere near 150 per hour which mm -hmm. is what you said I, I should be charging or i would like to charge also mm -hmm. so with her i didn't make it okay um, and uh -huh. when you go back to last week so uh, so you're on last week right now so i'm seeing eight and a half hours last week but i get the sense uh -huh. you're spending more than that so like are you not tracking the time you're working on your business like i don't see your instagram marketing time for example oh i'm on instagram like i maybe i should track it here like i think last week i didn't track it so much but i am spending i'm writing a lot of captions i'm writing a lot i'm sending a new, i'm sending loose newsletters and i also did like client roundups and everything but i did it in the app like on the instagram app saving stories and adding drafts so maybe I think last week I did like four hours, honestly, because I just look at my screen on the time. But I'll make a note because it would be cool to show you this and actually track, track, track religiously what I do. So yeah, I mean, I think it's it's really important when you're evaluating to see like all, all the time you spent in or on a business. In my opinion, it would be good to see it in one place because yes. right here, like it makes it seem like half of your work hours went to this Reinaldo client. but. Uh -huh. In truth, that probably isn't the case. It might be more like 25% or something when we factor in the time you spent answering emails, yeah. being in the DYF community, you know, doing like yeah. all that stuff. Um, but so I'm curious with these coaching clients, where is that represented? Other, let's see. No, because this is this week. Let's see. Playground. Che -che. Okay, here is this other client. 57 minutes. This is this other client, 57 minutes. This is only setting them up for August. Like this is uh, Susan Garzon also setting her up for August. So I have four. Others, I guess I have 18 minutes and 21 minutes in others. So that's, yeah, probably one. So what I'm sending, 57 minutes on Marina, setting her Notion dashboard, onboarding her. Uh, Don Susan Garzon, it was two hours to onboard her, send her a loom, just get her ready for August. Then Cheche, which is the other client for August, I did this last last week, and it was also 57 minutes onboarding her. So onboarding is something that, of course, I would uh, automate, or not automate, delegate, but also I make a video walking them through the notion, so mm -hmm. <laughs> difficult to delegate. And it does take an hour to do it. And these are other, all... The ones that are paying the 444 for that meeting plus two weeks of support? Yes, the red ones, all the red ones. Garden, which is one hour and 54, that was also um, doing that. The same thing, onboarding and sending her meeting notes. Okay. And how much do you have anything tracked of like how much time you're spending doing your Telegram support? Nope. And I really should. I sh you do know it. what I should do? I should sit down and book my Telegram hour. That's what I was going to suggest is that if you can time box it where like you can use, um, well, you could, I think, I don't know if Telegram will integrate with the desktop app, but like WhatsApp does, for example. And uh -huh. if it did, you could straight up mute WhatsApp notifications on your phone or in this case, Telegram, if they have a desktop app so that yeah. 
it's non-interruptive and that you have to seek it out. And then mm-hmm. you can have a time box where it's like Mondays at five or, and you can even tell your clients, like I check Telegram on Tuesdays and Thursdays at 4 p.m. or whatever, so that they don't expect an instant response. And then um, time box it and see how it feels and stuff. But uh, yeah, that's what I'd be really interested to see because what I'm seeing so far, you know, if if they're paying you 444 bucks and they take about two hours with nebulous Telegram support and that, that Telegram support amounts to, you know, let's say 30 minutes or less per client, like, you might still be doing fine. 444 gives you essentially budget for three hours at $150 an hour. Uh-huh. And so we don't have your targeted effective hourly rate yet, but just supposing it was 150 then that means if you can get it down to the three hours and you got rid of the interruptive, like mental energy draining you at all hours kind of thing, then it could be totally fine. But yeah, we have to have that data. And I can, if you want, I can show you my, my time audit for the past couple of weeks to show you what like what would be nice to work for, but work towards. But I think you probably already saw it in the time tracking workshop. So I don't uh-huh. know if you get value out of it. No, I'd love to. Let me hide. If you want to show me, um, I've sure. seen it. No, I haven't actually seen it so much. I okay, was like, then yeah, just hit uh-huh. stop sharing and I can share mine. Can you share? Okay, there we go. And so, all right. Okay. All right. So let me pull up mine. And I I'll guess I'll try it out narrate this for the people who are just on the audio podcast. So I'm now sharing my screen for Maya and I'll go to reports. So my last week actually was a very much in the business week. I had a client project that I was doing and what amounted to being essentially a client project for W Freelancing, which is one of the community members wanting some help with this convert kit. So I'm helping him build that out, but I'll repackage it later as a um, like a bonus or something. So it's still kind of on the business, but it's kind of in the business too. So when I look at my last week, I like to group things. So this is the default grouping by project and time entry in Toggle. And I can expand all these to see the time entry breakdown. But even at like a high level, I see last week, since I took Friday off, I tracked a total of 40 and a half hours. And I can see at a glance, I spent 11 and a half hours on this client project for Ford Anything. I spent seven hours being in the Accelerator community doing stuff that would be really difficult to delegate. So like I can expand that out and I can see office hours took me nearly three hours. Expert interview took me about two hours. Being on an Accelerator took me an hour. So I can like see, I can see these things to help me later do a time audit and say, what could I have gotten rid of? And I think last week I did. Um, Last week though was difficult because it was very much in the business work, but it was also very much difficult to delegate. The only things I really could have easily delegated would have been like the savvy cal task, but that's not a repeating task. You know, you only set up your calendar tool once. So does it really make sense to delegate a one-time 45-minute task to a VA or to just do it? You know, that's kind of the thing. The only things that repetitive tasks are like add people to courses. I definitely want a VA to help with that. Um, assigning recordings, I would love to have help yeah. with that, but it's it's hard to do. So Anyway, this is what I would love to see for you is to see something where you can see at a glance, okay, my biggest time sucks were this, 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 and this. And then we could like get a little bit more detail about them. Um, and and that's what this sorting by duration does. Like I, on average, I know I have about five good hours of deep work a day. That's like what my brain can handle. And so if this afford anything project is at 11 and a half hours, that represents like almost half of my whole work week. And then if the accelerator is seven, that's like another 25%. So there just wasn't a lot of room for doing things like building better courses, working on launches, strategic partnerships, any of the on the business stuff. So, so uh, do you have any questions on what you're seeing here to clarify anything? No, very, very interesting to see yours. Very, I might switch to toggle. Um, I should, honestly, this focus to do is like, a, <laughs> it's cute, you know, but I should be doing it a bit more. And if you can add the team, like, yeah, yeah I, yeah. the thing is, I feel like I have to set the systems up before I need them. Right now I could be keep doing what I'm doing because I'm still working less than I want to work, which is great. But I know that I have to set all the systems up before before they crumble or before I'm having to like, you know, paste like things together and like Frankenstein systems. So this was really helpful and I should set it up for success. Okay. And and I don't think like, I don't think you should put too much pressure on yourself because sometimes setting the systems up before they're necessary really 
can be premature scaffolding. Uh, sometimes just waiting until you need them and then setting them up is totally fine. I think it's when you have this like multi million dollar business that's predicated upon like copying and pasting and putting things in this weird Excel spreadsheet that you send to Sharon and then she needs to like paste it into her 1997 version of Excel because that's features that don't work. And then she does that and then sends it back to you. And then you paste that into a Word document and give that to your client. And then they sign it and scan the signing thing. And then you give it back to Sharon. And then Sharon has to, <laughs> that's when you get into trouble. But I don't yeah. think you'll ever hit that point since you like Notion and you like systems and things like that. Yeah. Um, so yeah, if you're feeling that you're hitting the limits, then maybe it is time to go to Toggle. I, I'm a big fan. I love, I love using Toggle for this. Maybe your okay. your cute one could do this. Uh, I haven't looked, but let's circle all this back into homework assignments. So when you're thinking about the current pain, it sounds like one piece of pain is feeling like this uh, coaching support is kind of like ballooning in scope. But we don't actually have data on that yet. And I've noticed for myself with my time audits, sometimes I feel like things take like 10 hours a week, like checking the inbox. But then when I actually track the time, I'm like, oh, it actually takes like one hour a week. I just really don't like doing it. So it feels like 10 hours. Uh -huh. um, and we don't know with these coaching projects you're doing, we don't know if it just feels that way or if it is that way. So maybe, maybe a good homework assignment there is like time box your... Uh, Telegram support and track all of your in and on the business time this week. Maybe that would be a good one there. How does that feel? Yeah, no, it's amazing. And one more mental homework that I'm giving myself is audit, audit, audit back and say, I spent 11 hours on this client that charged her this. I, my hourly rate went down to this. I did more than this. And now I'm really trying to find sweet spots there. Nice. And then uh, do you also like the idea of having an additional homework this week to create that hypothetical service offering and book your first like Trojan horse interviews or whatever a better term is that we got to find a better brandable term for that. Um, but to book your first like review calls with your clients to get their take on it. Do you like that as a homework as well? Mm -hmm. I mean, I think. Yeah. And do you think it's doable? Yeah, like I'm not I really like it. I plate. think I could even like, you know, I could even book a, no, no, it's fine. And I will tell you, Zach, if I feel like I'm having too much. The clients haven't ballooned yet. I just feel the tabs open. So you cut out for a second, Maya, but you were saying something like, what do you think of blank? So can you just say, ask me that again? Okay. What do you think instead of doing Trojan Horse to ask one of my clients who I know who she's going to be? Hello, we're starting your package today. Let me do a little experiment and offer you more, like offer you a higher offer for the price that you have, and you let me know how it goes. You know, like I'll I'll give you everything that is in your contract, but let me try a little bit more, and I just do that bad offer on them. What do you think? I like the seed of your idea, but what do you think about this instead? So, what if you have one of your clients who you're doing the eight at eight thing for? that you think would be a good fit for this hypothetical service offering. And mm -hmm. you essentially do exactly what you're saying, where you say, hey, what I would love to do is I'm putting together this beta service offering where I do blah, blah, blah. It's going to have sexy results, sexy results, sexy results, buy up 20 hours a month of your time, and I'm going to hold you accountable to do this shit that grows your business. I would normally charge blank for this, but I want to just test it out with you as a beta client, and you're like my favorite client, so I really want to do it with you. So how do you feel about this? I do this for you for a month and I have you do all the other stuff. And if it doesn't make any difference in your business, no worries. You just pay me the eight at eight. You already pay me and it was for free and I got to test it. But if it does have an impact on your business and it does drive revenue and we can, we can track that then and only then do you pay me for it. If the revenue it drives or the value you get from it outweighs the extra cost, how does this sound? You only pay if you made more money than you paid. Uh, so to me, like to me, that's the better sell, because if you just offer to do it for free, like you're not illustrating what it quote should cost or what it would normally cost. You're just saying like, hey, can I do more for you for less? And of course they're going to say yes. But what I'd rather see is like something where where you have the opportunity to be compensated if if this is as awesome as you hope. 
or Mm -hmm. something where you have the opportunity to turn them into a legit client. And if you don't anchor them to what this thing should cost and what you expect it to provide, like, I don't know that that will be quite as valuable. So what do you think of that slight reframe? The problem is that I feel like my clients are not making money, you know, yet they're launching, they're about to launch, they're investing everything on me. Some clients, yes, but the I feel like they wouldn't like that, you know. Um, I'm trying to think of another way. This is, okay, how about this? <laughs> what if I tell them, let's do this better offer, but I need you to track if you book more clients this month, if you do this, no, no, no. And at the end of the month, we're going to sit down and you're going to let me know. The way for you to pay me is letting me know if my service worked, you know. And I yeah. know I, I know it's better to get paid more, but that's also for me a value, actually. Yeah, I mean, and that's fine. Patient. Okay, I'll do, do yeah, that. But, I know exactly with whom. Yeah, I think that the the thing to require for them is number one, it would be great for them to have an estimate or even better would be a time tracking log of what they're spending right now per week on Instagram. And then, yes. and then have them track what they spend for this next month instead. And then make sure that they're using the time that you're freeing up to do the business growing stuff and track if they close more clients and things like that. And if if it's as simple as like what it was with with you, um, it should be easy to track. Like when I was like, Maya, just go do more marketing on Instagram. It was really easy for us to see the result of that because you like, we're obviously getting way more leads. So uh, I don't know if it'll quite be that with your clients because it's going to be things like maybe building strategic partnerships, which take time to go through the pipeline and stuff. Yeah. But, but yeah, maybe you can think of the low hanging fruit wins where it's like, these are the things that if my client did this, they would get an easy couple thousand dollars this month. Uh, if you can think of anything like that. Yeah. Yeah. Cause I, yeah, I want to make, I want to help them make more money because if they don't make money and they're just looking cute, you know, why would they hire me again? I wouldn't hire someone that's not making me money, you know? Yeah. But yeah, I mean, um, I think if you think about this in terms of like, what do you need to validate about this service offering to like personally believe in the value of it? It's kind of like, like after we're off this call, I offered to make you a free video thingy so I can test my own process since we're talking anyway, like for me, the thing I need to validate about my service offering that I'm working on for this experimental agency is like, does this actually work and save people time? And then mm-hmm. I later need to validate, can I get a writer to write in a client's voice? And so for me, doing this little micro freebie for you, because it doesn't really take me much time and it doesn't cost me that much in terms of staff resources to edit the video and stuff, like it's kind of a no-brainer because I, I tried to test on myself and I can't. And so I'm like, okay, I need to validate does this interview process even work? Easiest way to do that, just interview someone to try it. Uh, but in your case, you have things you need to validate, but I just want you to be mindful of your own time because this is going to take you like a lot of time and to invest 15 hours into something that will definitely be valuable, even if it's not as valuable as you hope for this specific person, it will inarguably be valuable. So for you to dump all this time into something and like not have any way to get compensated, even if it's hella valuable, like. I just don't think that seems ideal. And you could probably negotiate more strongly than that. Mm-hmm, I agree. Cool. All right. Well, this seems like, I guess, a good time time to call it. So what I've got down for you is creating a hypothetical service offering, doing some Trojan host interviews or pitching the beta thingy, uh, mm-hmm. calculating your effective hourly rate for your current coaching clients, time boxing your telegram time, and tracking all of your in and on the business time. Those are like your three goals. Does that sound right? Yeah. Okay. Tele and time boxing in general. Amazing. (laughs) Cool. All right. So then at this point, I'll just do the little outro. So if you, the listener, enjoyed this episode, be sure to like it and subscribe to and leave good reviews. And it benefits you to do this because by subscribing or leaving good reviews or whatever, you're probably going to see more helpful things like this. So it's in your best interest to do it. I'm trying to think of ways I can position it as a benefit to the listener. (laughs) Um, And as a reminder, if you join the Accelerator, you will get one-on-one coaching like this in a 20-minute box. I think today ended up going actually quite long with all the internet things. But 
uh, we do weekly one-on-one. So you can jump on, get 20 minutes of coaching with me and keep yourself moving forward. Uh, you also get access to all the past recordings of any office hours, expert interviews, community events, all that stuff. Uh, so if you want to join, you can learn more at dyf.link forward slash dyfa. And if you want to learn more about Maya's business, where can they go to learn more about you, Maya? At M-A-I-A-B-E-N, Maya Ben on Instagram. And I will repeat that because her internet chose this exact moment to lag. So it's at Maya Ben on Instagram. And for those of you here on video, you can just see her frozen face as I say this. <laughs> but at M-A-I-A-B-E-N on Instagram is the best place to follow her. So <clears throat> thanks for being here. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Frozen Maya. Oh, there you are, in Frozen. Hello. Thank you, Unfrozen Maya. Great to chat. And uh, thanks, listener, for being here. We will connect <laughs> next week.